Well, hi. Now, if you are um, an experienced denizen of the internet, you are probably aware that there are, um, well, that one of my favorite things, I know I have many favorite things on the internet, but one of my favorite things, um, you're probably aware of it, astral marriages, a topic near and dear to my heart, a favorite thing. Unfortunately, um, the one I want to talk about, there isn't, uh, as far as I know, much material about it beyond the, uh, the source I have here. This topic is the Snape Wives, that is, the wives of Severus Snape, who has a He's apparently a polygamist. I did not know this. I, I knew he was a Death Eater. I knew that he, uh, you know, he's a bit of a racist at times, a jerk, not nice to kids. I did not know he was a polygamist. But he, he is, and um, we have the word of the internet for that. And uh, this this may be a throwback for some of you. But this is a story I really like, this story of these women who believe that they were married to Severus Snape. It, uh, I, I just find it pretty amusing, even though it's old. Um, so, what I have here, a woman has written an academic paper about this particular phenomenon, which I think is very interesting. She's come to a couple of conclusions about it, which I might comment on, but I also want to read quotes from the Snape wives themselves. Because they're very interesting in that not only do they believe they're married to this character, but they also follow it, they, they follow him as a sort of religious figure. And this is a, a step too far, in my opinion. I mean, you can marry Sephiroth all you want. You can, well... You can marry Reshiram. You could marry whoever you... Reshiram is a Pokemon, as far as I know. There is a man who's married to her. Um, and there are women married to Sephiroth from the uh, Final Fantasy VII uh, video game. That's all well and good, but religions? Well, there are some pop, pop culture religions out there. Um, I've definitely seen that before. Um, my, uh... Yeah, so my, I, I'm not inexperienced with this. This is not the first time I've seen it, but... Uh, this is one of the more entertaining things I've seen, uh, particularly with the intensity, you know, the marriage plus the religion, and uh, also I happen to be a Harry Potter fan, and uh, so I have my own views on, on the characters and uh, how they, how Rowling chose to uh, designate their fates. <laughs> um, all right. So without further ado, as I always say, we have a paper by Ms. Zoe Alderton titled Snape Wives and Snapeism, a fiction-based religion within the Harry Potter fandom. And this can be accessed, or it was accessed by me on September 13th of 2019 um, at www.mdpi.com slash 2077-1444 slash 5 slash 1 slash 219 slash htm. All right. So, from the intro, we have the following. This will just explain to all of you what Ms. Alderton was trying to do with this. In this article, I explore two main features of the religion Snapeism. The first feature is its context within fandom and the negative reception it has received from this group of people. The second is the manner in which the Snapists themselves have articulated their faith structures. When considered together, these elements of Snapism reveal how online popular culture-based religions are forming, and the strong notions of what is properly religious, that's in quotes, which abound both in fandom more broadly and within the Snapist community itself. Fandom subcommunities like the Snapists are a good case study for the problems of interpretation when facing a faith that seems to be objectively untrue in terms of its, of its historicity and logic, and based on metaphysical beliefs that are impossible or absurd. Uh, well, all right, full disclosure, I'm an atheist. <laughs> I, I don't think anything more need be said at this point. As this article will demonstrate, Snapeism is usually interpreted as a ludicrous and therefore invalid religion. 
This anxiety towards fiction-based religions and the behavior of their adherents is based upon a general fear within fandom of being excessively outrageous and pushing the boundaries of good taste too far. By policing extreme manifestations of the Harry Potter fandom, other eccentricities can be placed in the more neutral category of ironic or playful, as opposed to insane. This boundary policing is a virulent and under-researched manifestation of fandom communities. And she goes on. I'm not going to read her whole thing, because it's her thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the parts I find relevant, and the parts that include direct quotations from the Snape wives themselves, and I'm going to comment on them uh, when I see fit. But first I've got to wet the old whistle. All right. Understanding Snape Wives and Snapeism. This is from section two. Um, an in so, all right. <laughs> this is a quote. An intense heat washed through me as I felt being electrically charged and exploded. I cried, I moaned, I screamed, I howled my master's name as wave after wave and surge after surge hit and washed through me. I knew he was pleased as right after I felt him explode in me as well. A lot of explosions going on here. This stirring line of fan fiction. All right, stirring is not the word I would have used for it, but all right, Zoe. This stirring line of fan fiction epitomizes the pleasure and ecstasy of an ethereal dalliance with Severus Snape. It is also an example of why the author of this passage has been mercilessly lampooned for her, her assumed insanity, the madness of the Snape wives. But aside, I don't think that they're insane. I just think it's silly. I don't think these women are insane, um, based on what I've read. I think that they have issues they may be ignoring in their own lives, they may have issues with their own relationships, but I do not think that they are divorced from reality. I think that they're probably, they were, or are, if they're still doing this, consciously deluding themselves um, for probably, you know, pretty mundane reasons. All right. Um, moving on. The term Snape Wives is an edic descriptor, primarily pejorative, which nonetheless reflects a serious and long-term commitment to Snape. The Urban Dictionary, oh them again, we're going to probably see them a lot, describes the Snape Wives as a group of middle-aged women on the internet who believe they were all married to Severus Snape from the Harry Potter books on the astral plane. They have real-life meetings where they take turns channeling the spirit of Snape so they can have wedding ceremonies with him. There is infighting over whom Snape loves more and whether Snape is an emotional wooby who just needs to be loved or a domineering master who lives, of all things, to be dominant. <laughs> there are several problems with this description. Firstly, the Snape wives reject Snape as an appropriate title for the object of their affections, like, despite that being his name in canon. That's me. Um, I mean, that's me adding that. I'm not saying I'm... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not the canonical Snape. <laughs> okay. In addition, they live in different countries, and only two have met in person. Not all are able to channel Harry Potter characters. <laughs> oh, really? Well, neither am I. And there is mass consensus that Snape is powerfully domineering. Nevertheless, this definition does reflect popular attitudes toward the wives within the Harry Potter fandom. In 2008, two of the wives coined the term Snapists to describe themselves. They write, Basically, we are Snapists, followers of Severus Snape. And since he has become our religion, Snapism! In this article, I will focus on the three main wives, Conchita, Rose, and Tanya. Each of these women has dedicated numerous online journals to their discussion of Snape as a supernatural figure and his role in their lives. They all acknowledge each other as fellow Snape devotees, fandom companions, and spiritual spouses. Rose and Tanya both have vivid experiences of Snape within their lives, frequently experiencing clues as to his presence and intentions for them. Tonya, or Tanya, excuse me, even channels Snape and has assisted others to hear his voice. Conchita seems to have the greatest trouble in terms of her inclusion within the group and her ability to encounter Snape in a supernatural manner. Okay, so that's all I'm going to read from part two because um, that's what I consider relevant. So we have a little bit of an introduction to who they are, um, 
how they relate to one another. Um, it seems here like Conchita is a bit of an outsider. Tanya is, uh, oh, yeah. Tanya can channel him, and uh, Conchita is more of the outsider who has, you know, she she's the black sheep of the whole thing, I, I suppose. Anyway, on to part three. So here's my excerpt from part three. Again, all of these are excerpts from an academic paper. They are not verbatim, you know, I'm not reading it verbatim. I'm not uh, going to read the whole thing. Um, if you do want to read the whole thing, you can go to the website I mentioned. And again, all credit goes to Zoe Alderton. Okay, so part three. Rowling was wrong. Canon skepticism as a context for Snapists. The idea that Rowling was somehow wrong, or Rowling, Rowling, yes, was somehow wrong in her portrayal of Snape, or in the decisions she made for him, is surprisingly common. Because there was a large gap between the publications of books, the largest being from July 2000 to June 2003, in a very active fandom awaiting new material, speculation about the future of almost every character abounded. Many had come to expect a more public display of his essential goodness and loyalty, and some kind of reward for the dangers he had faced. These expectations were shared and supported via two years' worth of community discussion, speculation, and fanfiction. When his expected rewards did not eventuate, a more extreme wing of fandom began to see Snape as something of an objective reality, with Rowling as a flawed scribe who does not own him. On the whole, this does not manifest in the belief that Snape literally exists, but it can be seen as a logical precursor to this attitude. Now, I'm going to say something as a person who likes to write myself. Um, I wouldn't appreciate it if somebody just told me that I did the wrong thing for a character when I was certain that I had done the right thing. Um, however, I think that I would uh, be open to people writing fanfiction and all that kind of stuff because they're going to do it anyway and some of it some of it's going to be good some of it's going to be bad um and if if it's good i think it would it would deserve as much recognition as my own work if i were a successful writer which i'm not <laughs> or i wouldn't be sitting here reading this or maybe i would anyway so we're going to move on to part five after reading those little excerpts from part three um you know, we can see a, a few more comments on part three. Uh, I know that there was a lot of rather vitriolic disagreement as to who should get together with whom and what should happen to different characters and, oh, why did she kill off so-and-so? I personally just always accepted it as this is the way she needed to tell the story. You know, st uh, stories don't always... You don't have a choice, necessarily. I as I, uh, like, again, as a person who likes to write, I know you don't always have a choice. Sometimes it's just, well, that's the way it is. That is the way that it shook out in my head, and I cannot see it any other way. Okay. So I don't really, I, I guess I'm not entirely there with them. Like, I, I like the idea of speculating about the other things that might have happened to a character if, if things had gone differently, maybe. But I'm not going to go so far as to tell the author they were wrong. Because I don't know what's behind it. Um, you know, maybe Rowling just thought this is the only way for Snape. He was one of the more compelling characters in the story. Um, you know, he was there from day one and uh, had a, a pivotal role in, you know, the ultimate outcome. And... Uh, you know, had a, a kind of a tragic backstory. It also is a flawed character, which I think people like because we're flawed people. You know, most people have flaws. Most of us have hurt a friend. Most of us have done things we regretted. And those were some of the defining things about him. So I can understand why, you know, this is another aside. I can understand understand why somebody would find him to be, you know, would, would uh, get into him as a character because... You know, he's not all good, he's not all evil, he's more like a human being. You know, sometimes Harry's a bit too heroic, but that, that makes more sense because he's young. You know, he launches himself into, you know, he, um, he's, he's young and idealistic, and so are the rest of his, his crew. 
Um, but the adult characters, um, maybe they have more complicated motivations because they have more of a past. Particularly Snape, he certainly has a past. <laughs> okay, um, moving on. Five, Snape theology and the reality of Snape. I believe that Severus Snape exists independently of J.K.R. He is a living, feeling spirit. I believe anything is possible and that Severus does visit those he chooses to. Tanya's all-caps testimony epitomizes the beliefs and practices of the Snapists. The basis of the wives' belief system is the existence of Snape as a spiritual force who resides outside of the Harry Potter book series. While the wives realize that not everyone will experience Snape on this level, really not everyone, they ask that their viewpoints be respected in keeping with the social system of religious tolerance. Rose writes, The ones who will believe will believe, others just won't. Tough. Just like Christianity isn't for everyone, Master is the same. Christianity is used as their standard for a normal and respectable religion when they argue for the validity of Snapism. Yeah, um, that would make sense. They probably come from Western cultures where Christianity and perhaps Judaism are the dominant religions. And furthermore, I mean, this whole idea of self-sacrifice and all of that, that's something that, that is intrinsic to Christianity and also is present in the Harry Potter universe, both in Harry's behavior, um, in, well, okay, yeah, and in a lot of, a lot of characters behave that way. Harry, Dumbledore, Lily, Snape. A lot of characters behave in a self-sacrificing manner and know they're, you know, so there's a, not that self-sacrifice is exclusive to uh, media or cultural products of, of Christian, you know, primarily Christian civilizations, but it's, it's just, it's a major trope. So we have that a lot in these novels. Um, so uh, there are several reasons why it's no surprise that they would take that into consideration. Rose describes Snape as real as much as the Christian God is, too. She asks, do I need help? No. No more than usual. No. Am I delusional? Lol, are Christians delusional? No. Well, delusional maybe not. I think they're wrong. That's me. Rose notes that it is hard that is it, that is it is hard to prove the existence of any non-corporeal objects, including spiritual figures, ghosts, and the spiritual realm as a whole. She does not feel that the inability of others to perceive Snape makes him any less of a reality. Like other spirits, the soul essence, the soul, as in the soul's body and soul, essence is out of sync with our naked eyes. On naked eyes. But this is not seen as a barrier against knowing him. And it's not it's not capitalized. It just happened to be on the next page, so it sounds extra against knowing him. It sounds extra important when I, I accidentally said it like that. They might as well have put it like that with the, the, the capital H, him. Yeah. She has still managed to connect to Snape, Snape through phantom smells, taste, sounds, and feelings. She claims that she and the other Snapists have felt this touch. No, not mere in our imagination, but on our skins! With a capital S. The Snapists are keen to testify as to Snape's holy and power, powerful nature. Conchita informs us that everything Severus related is sacred to me. He is also omniscient. She notes that he can see what I do and what I don't. He knows me better than anyone, than I know myself. The depth of his awareness is seconded by Rose, who agrees that he is wise and knows far beyond our comprehension. He has also helped her to open my mind to see beyond. In response to the depths of his, the depth of his power and impact upon her life, Rose declares Snape to be the reason, my reason, my sanity, my life, my growth, my guidance, my love, my focus, my aid, my lord, my master, my teacher, everything, and so very much more. On Conchita's journal, she testifies, He also visits me, talks with me, advises me, aids me, helps me grow and understand, as well as aids with life's bullshits, with a capital B, and I am as they are, so very much richer for that. His powers allow him to pervade the lives of the Snapists and alter their patterns of behavior, Dot, dot, dot. All right. I think I, I omitted something there. I'm, again, reading excerpts. So my next excerpt. 
from this part is the Snapists are keen to oh yep I've copied over I've copied the same passage twice well crap unsurprisingly he is the major emotional component of their lives Conchita loves Snape more than I have ever loved anyone and would die for him without hesitating. He is an antidote to her life, which is, other, which is otherwise cruel and pointless, quote-unquote. He is her eternal light, the one that made me feel alive. She explains, no Severus equals no life. Conchita declares that nothing can end her love for Snape, not even Snape himself, because he is a part of me. With similar passion, Rose loves him beyond reason, understanding, or comprehension. I am completely and insanely obsessed. Tanya asks, Have you ever wanted something so badly that you ached from within your very soul for it, that it gnaws at your heart and very being? At times, it brings tears to my eyes, and I find myself trembling from this need. She confesses, I have never experienced anything this intense before now. There are times when I feel that my soul is being torn asunder with this fierce desire. Obsession is a mild word for what I feel for Severus Snape. Some nights she even cries out of lust for, for Snape. <laughs> she even cries out of lust for Snape, okay. She testifies that without him there is nothing. Life is just nothing. Okay, bit dramatic there. Maybe I, well, I mean, I read it in a dramatic manner, but come on, ladies. <laughs> Okay, by far the most talented channel is Tanya. In a self-insert fanfiction, Snape announces that she is the vessel, and that he prefers to write to his wives through her. Well, that's convenient for Tanya, isn't it? I always mispronounce her name, so forgive me if I say Tonya or Tanya or something like that. When starting a new blog, Tanya announced Severus Snape himself may speak here. This is his journal as well. She requests that people only follow the blog if they believe that Severus is a believe that Severus is a spirit and have a very open mind. In regard to her online channeling, Tanya specifies it is never roleplay. She also states that she has no control over Snape or what he might when he might choose to appear. Tanya's ability to channel has allowed her to introduce new codes of conduct and beliefs into the group. You think? She seems a little bit like a budding cult leader here. For example, she announces that Snape despises annoying, giggling fangirls whom think, whom think, they understand him as being a cute, fluffy, funny being. As Snape, she makes clear, I only give audience to those women who are strong and able to withstand my fierce temp temper and do as I say. I coldly ignore those vain, simpering females that hold the thought like a leaky sieve. Alright, I have something to say about this. If they're so strong, why would they put up with your shit temper? Like, why wouldn't they throw you out a window? That's what I would do. I mean, I could never be with someone like this Snape, Snape individual. As interesting a character as he is, you know, he's not a likable character. He's not somebody you want to hang out with. Um... I'd much rather, rather have a beer with Hagrid or something, you know? I, I don't think I'd want to hang out with Snape. He sounds like a jerk. Alright. Whilst moving house, Tanya was temporarily unable to be online. Oh no. She recounts an incident in which she asked Snape if he would follow her to her new home. A dog kicked some rubbish out of her hands, including an Ace of Clubs playing card. Because she often comes across this card, Tanya took it uh, took this as his sign of saying yes, albeit an inferior offline affirmative gesture. Inferior offline affirmative gesture. Alright. Snape can also be channeled by anyone through objects that are connected to him. Rose and Tanya created a room for Snape in Rose's house, where his posters are hung. This room is associated with supernatural blessings and events. For example, also yesterday, after we rehung some of Master's picks in their room, I felt the harsh shove push against my back and fell forward on the floor with my hands catching. I was kneeling on hands and knees before my Master. 
Later on, he revealed to me what he had done. He had stood behind me and with his knee shoved me forwards. Thud, thud, thud. Okay. Get some self-esteem, lady. Like, even if... It's, it's kind of sad. You have a fictional abuser. <laughs> I'm sorry. I... This is the part I find sad. It, it, he seems like a jerk and, and it's like there are enough assholes in real life in real life that you have to deal with that it, you might come across or end up dating at some point and have to get rid of and they're making one up for themselves. All right. I, I guess I don't really understand the need. Um, any representation of... Any representation of Snape is, see, is seen to be a point of connection to him. For example, Rose becomes infuriated over the treatment of a highly realistic Tonner brand Snape doll. She was appalled that after reading of Snape's teenage humiliation in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix of 2003, fans would deem it appropriate to check under his clothes to see if he has knickers on and take pics of his naked rump on the internet. What is it with their spelling naked that way? It's like... N-A-K-I-D, or N-A-C-K-I-D in the last case, on the internet. She states, I wouldn't ever dare disrespect Master in such a humiliating manner. Um, I'm sure there are people on the internet that would disagree with you. Like, they would think humiliating Snape is erotic in some way. I think I've come across that here and there. But also, if you're having a sexual relationship with this entity... Wouldn't you have seen him without underwear before, or with underwear? Or I, I don't understand. I mean, I, I'm not involved in an astral marriage, so I don't really, uh, you know, I don't have all the, I don't have the skinny. But, yeah, so, um, that's an introduction, uh, to the beliefs and experiences of the Snape Wives. We will be continuing with this. Again, this is a topic that I, I think is, uh, ripe for examination and so we yeah we've got to keep going um like it or not thank you very much for listening